by the way, Jim, that wasn't your eyes. That was a misprint. And guess who the proofreader is? Moi. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll share the blame. We'll share the blame. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, I want to read a couple of verses. The message is the supremacy of God. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Now go over to one other verse in Proverbs. Go now back to the Old Testament. Proverbs 16, 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. The message says it this way. Make your motions and cast your votes, but God has the final say. I kind of like that because that's really what it's saying. Make your motions, cast your votes, but God has the final say. Now back in 1488, there was a lady named Mother Shipton. I don't know how many of you know that name. And then in the 1500s, uh, Nostradamus. And after that, Edgar Case and Jean Dixon and a host of others. All of them made some pretty credible predictions about the future, and it was all very interesting. Never quite sure what to think or make of that. Uh, but the truth is, no one can predict the future accurately with certainty all the time. Maybe the great old prophets of the Old Testament could, but uh, consequently, the future can be very threatening, and it can be frightening to a lot of people. A good example would be the year 2020. <laughs> This year, the hands of the doomsday clock, which is in Chicago, were moved to 100 seconds before midnight. Midnight, of course, representing the end of the world and the end of civilization. So I cannot count on tomorrow, nor can I count on improved health or the, the, the stock market, the economy, the church, and certainly I can't, you know, I can't count on making it on time to the airport, not when I live here, but I can try. One of the marks of spiritual and emotional maturity is when we understand that most of life is beyond our control. A lot of people understand that, maybe a few don't. So I focus on the things I can control, and I accept what I cannot, and then what did I tell you to do last Sunday? Ah, relax. Now I know that it, you know, it's not an easy thing, and we talked about it, and the idea is not to be anxious. So, there's, there's a lot that I cannot control, uh, that I can't manipulate, but there's something that I can count on, and that is that God is in control. I know you've heard that before, I hope. In 1 Chronicles 29, 11, it says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, the majesty, for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. The Living Bible ends it with, in control of everything. A description in part of what, of all, all of that is simply the word sovereignty. The sovereignty of God. It means God is the absolute authority in life, and he is in control. So I'm going to give you number, I'm going to number and letter this sentence. I, I haven't given you an outline lately, I'm sorry. Um, but, for, for those of you who actually take notes, Okay. <laughs> Number one, the Bible says God is in control of nature. Now, that's, that's a message in itself, and we could have a lot of interest and a lot of fun with that, but I'm going to simply say that he created nature, he sustains it, and has the ability to overrule nature, and that's sometimes what we call a miracle. My friend, Reverend Paul Gafford, defined a miracle this way. When we step across the boundary line between the human and the divine, where human res resources stop and where divine resources begin... So the number one, God is in control of nature. 
Secondly, the Bible says God is in control of history. Life is linear. History is moving toward a climax. Jesus is coming back. The great white throne judgment will happen as advertised. God designed time for humanity. Otherwise, he has nothing to do with time. He designed time for humanity, and history is the stuff of past events, okay? God's grand design. God is in control of history. Number three... God is in control of life's journey. You say, no, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the master of my faith, thank you. Oh, uh, yeah? You know, the last paragraph of W.E. Henley's uh, poem, Invictus, says, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. If you are the captain of your soul, you're in very poor hands. You're in shaky hands. You may not recognize it, but in some areas, you have absolutely no control, no choices, really. Did you choose your place of birth, by the way, any of you? (laughs) Did you choose the date of your birth? Did you choose your parents? Did you choose your nationality? Did you even choose your personality? (laughs) Don't think so. Maybe you've adjusted it a little bit. Every gene in your body was designed by God because he's the master designer. Well, if God is in control, do I have any say? Do I have any choice? Well, of course, your greatest gift next to Jesus Christ is your freedom of choice. But your choices are limited, right? I mean, if you're on a cruise ship, and we went that one time, you sent us, that was a wonderful thing, I mentioned it last Sunday. Maybe you're going to the Bahamas or you're going to Cozumel, Do you have any choices? Well, of course you do. What you're going to eat? How many times you're going to eat (laughs) on a cruise ship? You're going to swim in the pool? You're going to sit in the sun? You're going to play shuffleboard? You're going to the top deck? We used to go to the top deck because there was a library at the very top, and and you could get coffee or chai tea, and you could see this magnificent view. But your choices are limited, right? You can't stop the cruise from its destination. It's a bit like life. In life, you're free to make many choices. Some are good and some are bad, but life marches on. I cannot turn back the clock, and I'm not free from the consequences of my choices. I'm free to choose to accept and pursue God's plan for my life. Or, before I continue, let me, let me, let me just, as I, I want to just stop here for a minute just sort of in the process of what we're talking about, I'm free to choose to accept God's plan, to pursue God's plan, but let's, let me just stop for a minute, uh, and let me share this conversation between Dr. Dennis Kinlaw and a handsome, he describes him as a handsome young man who was seated next to him on a plane. Now, if you don't know who Dennis Kinlaw is, a great Methodist scholar, pre- former president, I think more than once, of Asbury College, maybe the seminary as well, uh, I've heard him speak many, many times. He's, he's now the late Dennis. He died about three or four years ago. But uh, a great friend of, uh, if you remember Joy, that comes to speak to us once in a while, I think Joy called him Poppy. That was, uh, but he was a great man. Anyway, he described this guy as a handsome young man. He was seated next to him on a plane. The man had several maps of Mexico be- between them, and uh, so Dr. Kinlaw was cautious. He thought, well, maybe this guy's a missionary. Uh, Ken Law was, among other things, also a great preacher, a great evangelist. So referring to the stack of materials, he said, is that good history that you have there of Mexico? And the response was, it's the best I've been able to find. And he handed uh, Ken Law a book. And uh, Ken Law leafed through the book. It was marked much like a PhD's textbook would be with, just as he prepares for an oral exam. And there were notes. The handwriting was clear. The style was lucid. And Kinlaw perceived that this guy was a very well-educated young man. Question, why are you so interested in Mexico? The young man said, well, I have about a 30-day vacation. I want to see Mexico City by foot. I'd also like to see it by public transportation. At some point, the man asked Kinlaw, what are you reading? Well, uh, Ken Law handed him a, a book entitled uh, Of the Trinity by St. Augustine. He looked at the book and he said, are you a Christian? And Ken Law said, yes, are you? And Dennis expected him to say yes. Instead, he said, oh, no, I'm an atheist. At least, I think I am. And then he asked Ken Law, do you believe in prayer? 
And Kinlaw said, yes, I do. And the young man said, why? Well, Kinlaw had been going through it with his son. He'd been very sick. Uh, and, and so he related this experience, this ordeal, uh, uh, related how God was touching and healing his son. And he finished the story with the words, yes, I believe in prayer. Let, let me just say this about the story. As we talk about the choices we have on this journey, I'm just now coming to the point in the story which is really very meaningful to me because I appreciate an open mind. It doesn't matter if it's a Christian or a non-Christian, a Democrat or Republican, an FAU fan or an FIU fan. I like, a, I like an open mind. I think it's very refreshing. I mean, we have our own convictions, but we can still converse and have an open mind. When Kinlaw finished his story, the young atheist said, well, that's wonderful about his son and how his son was doing. That's amazing. You know, I think, he said, I think I believe in prayer. Well, then it was Kinlaw's chance to say, why? Well, he said, I had, this, I had vicious uh, migraine headaches. And they were destroying me. I went to every specialist that I could find. I went everywhere I could go, and they said, there's no hope. We, can't, we, don't, we don't know how to fix your problem. And the headaches, he said, were so unbearable that I finally decided I would have to commit suicide. But then he said, as I thought about that, it made me think. Religious people pray, and they say that that helps sometimes. I don't suppose it would hurt to try to pray. But how does an atheist pray, he's thinking. I didn't know if there, were, if there was anyone to hear my prayer, or if there was someone whether he would be interested in me anyway. So I prayed these words. I don't know whether you are or not. I don't know whether you could or not. I don't know whether you would or not, but if you are, and if you could, and if you would, I would be most grateful. And then he went on. He said, the amazing thing is, the headaches went away. He said, I thought, what a lucky coincidence, and what a happy one. And then I had a second thought. That's a cheap way out. What if there is someone out there who did this, and I give credit to chance? So I decided to pray again. I don't know whether you did or not. I don't even know whether you are or not. But if you are and you did, I want you to know my gratitude. And then he said, I had another thought. The atheist continued. A lot of splendid serendipities have happened to me, things I never expected, things I never did, never did anything to merit. They just dropped into my life. Good things. So I thought, what if there's somebody out there who cares about me enough that he did these things for me, and I've never really taken the opportunity. I've just taken it all for granted. I've never even stopped to say thank you. So he said, I prayed again. I don't know whether you did all these things or not, but if you did, I want you to know my gratitude. Now, Dr. Kinlaw said something interesting. First, he said, I was very impressed by this, of course, but my first thought was, you may think you're an atheist, but you're a lot further along than many of my Methodist friends. <laughs> and then the young man said, do you think this conversation is an accident? And Kinlaw laughed, and he said, you know, actually, I don't. He said, I wasn't even supposed to be on this flight. And the young man laughed, and he said, that's fascinating. I'm not supposed to be on this plane either. You know, I don't believe this conversation is an accident. This is still coming from the atheist, by the way. About that time the plane landed in San Antonio, Ken Law then had this thought. Oh, Lord, you can't let this conversation stop now. Just, I've just gotten to the place where I can tell him about you. <laughs> and he said, it was though, as God, he said, it's as though God spoke to me. I could hear his voice saying, well, I thought I was doing pretty well with him before you came along. Recently, I talked about sharing Christ and what we say and how we live. What we say is very important, of course, and how we say it and how subtle sometimes we say it, how careful we are not to step on toes. He that wins souls is wise, but we're never first and we're never alone in influencing someone to believe. We never arrive in someone's life before the Holy Spirit. If God leads me to someone Someone else has been there before me. I mean, it's, 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 it's something that we share in the way we live our lives. You can say, as you know, you can say a lot of things about being spiritual, but if you're not, it's not going to make any difference. But if you live that life, it's so important. 
other people have been there before you. So back to number two, God is in control. And on this journey, I have choices, free to choose, free to accept God and his plan for me. The young man in Ken Law's story is free to accept that there is a prime mover, that there is a God, or he can reject God and he can live for himself and he can enthrone himself. And of course, choices, good or bad, all have consequences. The good news of number two is described in the words of the songwriter, Iris Stamphill. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. On this journey, I have the, I have, so I have all these choices. Now, there are three things that I want you to remember. Letter A, I'm going to, now I'm going to the letters. Letter A, because God is in control, my plans will have a limit. In Proverbs 19.2, the NIV says, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. God has the last word. Have you ever had God change your plans? I have to think about that sometimes. C.T. Studd was an English sportsman. He played cricket for England. At that time, he would have been well-known all throughout England, and he became a missionary ultimately uh, after he became a Christ follower to China, India, and Sudan. And he gave away all of his fortune, and he had a great fortune. They come from a very rich family. Uh, he gave his fortune to Dr. George Mueller, who was also a great man of faith. Many of you know the story about how he spent his life taking care of orphans by faith, people just giving, just like this man did, and thousands and thousands of orphans. So he gave all the, almost all of his money to, to Mueller, and, and he made a very interesting statement as follows. I didn't realize at first it was, I think it was a poem, but this statement, some wish to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. And that's probably what he was doing in some of those places. Now back to my question. Have you ever had God change your plans? We'll go on with the story. C.T. Studd tells the story about his dad. His dad was a great wealthy sportsman who loved to bet the horses, play the cards. Uh, he loved to hunt and, and uh, he loved theaters and he loved to attend balls and he was just always really just having fun all his life. Very rich. At some point, D.L. Moody, who was maybe the greatest lay preacher in, in the history of the world, came to England to preach, and he was being persecuted by the media. Uh, column after column was being printed in the newspaper against Moody. And Stead's father finally said, you know, I've been reading about this guy, this Moody. When he comes to London, I'm going to go hear him because there must be something good about any man who the media is so much trying to destroy. And uh, so the story goes on that he did finally go to Moody's service. And that night, without being able to go into a lot of detail, because it is a great story, but that night God changed his plans. He was no longer interested in many of the things that had been his whole life. In fact, he sat down and talked to Moody and said, well, now, you know, I do this and this and this and this. Can I, what can I do and what can I do as a, as a Christ follower? He said, well, you can do most of everything that you were already doing, but, you know, once you lead someone to the Lord, you're not really going to care about a lot of that. And it's exactly what happened. Suddenly his key interest was the kingdom. Now, many are the plans in a man's heart, the Bible says, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. When I graduated from high school, I had no plan to be a preacher. It was the last thing on my mind. When I attended church on March the 1st, 1970, I had no plans to commit my life to the Lord. I didn't have anything against God and and uh, I, I believed in him, but I wasn't interested, you know, not, not right now, maybe when I get old and I really need him. But anyway, it happened. Maybe I had some short-term plans, and it's all right to have plans, by the way, but the Proverbs writer says, but the Lord directs your steps. The Lord directs your steps. So let God lead. Be flexible to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I welcome that in my life. Our best laid plans are only tentative, so ask God to direct you. Planning without prayer, by the way, is presumption. So don't leave prayer out. Uh, I think it was John Lennon, it was one of the Beatles that said, life happens while you're making plans. It really does, doesn't it? Now, let me suggest a great prayer as you're making plans. And when you hear this, if you just now woke up, you've heard it once before and you think I just preached the same message, but it, it isn't. I suggest a great prayer to pray, oh God, what now? What now? Pray it every day. Every day. What now about my family? Or what now about a certain relationship? Or my finances? Or my employment? Listen, it's always best to pray 
And I think Rick Warren or someone said this, it wasn't me, but, oh God, help me to discover and do what you're blessing. Not always ask you to bless what I'm doing. There's a difference. Oh, I'm doing this now, Lord, and it looks good, so will you bless what I'm doing? No, God, I want to do what you're blessing. Show me, lead me, and guide me. Not always easy to find the Lord's will. Other times, not so difficult. Let her be, because God is in control. My problems have a purpose. The good news is not, you know, life is not a, a series of random events, events without meaning. Life goes, it really does have purpose. It really does have meaning. You know, even the bad is father-filtered. Now, I'm not suggesting that everything that happens to you is, is God's will, because it isn't. God, God's will is not always done on earth. You understand that? God's will is not always... If it was, we wouldn't have been praying almost every Sunday. We didn't this week. We heard it sung, but uh, we wouldn't, he wouldn't have instructed us to pray, Thy will be done, if everything on earth was according to his will. God didn't put Paul in prison, but he allowed it to happen, and while Paul was incarcerated, he wrote most of the New Testament that probably would not have happened if he had not been confined. He was a man of action, not a scribe. It is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Most shameful, painful, embarrassing event in history, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ became the most glorious event. It is the Lord's purpose that prevails. My problems do have purpose. Remember the words of Joseph? We talked about him last week to his brothers who sold him into slavery and all these terrible things happened. You guys, you're not in trouble. You meant it for bad, but God meant it for good. It's kind of hard to fathom that, you know, especially if it happens to you or me. But I told you a few weeks ago that that I would talk to you about COVID for just a moment, the curse and the blessing. I, I think we're living a curse. I do believe that, but is there a blessing? What have we learned? Have we learned anything as we deal with this issue, profit or loss for the church? I'm, first of all, of the opinion it's loss, but, and I'm going to give you the rest of it, okay? Uh, Romans 8.28, as you know, says, we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So what do we profit from this? What's the blessing? What good could possibly come from it? Let me give you a few without too much commentary. Number one, we've been reminded that the building is not the church. I think we knew that anyway. I mean, the the building, if a hurricane comes along and takes the building and we're all sitting here on the ground just like we are now, this is the church. It doesn't matter where. Number two, the church is probably reaching more people than ever before. Online, YouTube, Facebook, etc., etc., Number three, we've become more sensitive and compassionate as a people. Maybe not everyone, but most of us. Number four, a lot of people used to dread to go to work, but there are a lot of people now that are glad to go to work. Number five, shut-in time doesn't have to be shut-down time. It took us a while to learn that, but there's some good things that can happen. Number six, we realize the importance of touch. We missed handshakes and hugs. I miss holding Poppy when we we had a baby dedication and any other little babies that I want to go like this, but no, maybe Mama doesn't want me to hug that baby. In fact, you know, babies can even die if they're never touched. That's, That's how important touch is. Number seven, Christianity is good under the blue dome. In fact, I I watched, I don't know, maybe through one of you, I was able to watch two or three outdoor Bible studies that were at Ocean Reef. And I don't know if any of you got that on your on your phone or not. And uh, these there are outdoor worship services, which I would love to do here. I just don't like to fight the traffic noise. You know, we might be doing a Sunday morning outdoor. There are outdoor Bible studies. There are more boats on the water. There are more gardens being planted. There's more uh, rediscovery of God's nature. Kind of forced to do that, but that's happening. And number eight, Actually, there probably would be more, but number eight, the original venue for the church was the home. The centerpiece for gathering the ecclesia, the body, was the table. In fact, in the temple, uh, the the altar was the table. 
The new altar is the table, gathering place of the family at least for a time. We're all indoors more than we used to be. You know, if you don't watch the commercials on television, and instead of nearly naked Britney Spears selling Pepsi or or some other uh, sexual sort of appeal, look how many times they're gathered around the table. You you may be surprised until you begin to think about it. Uh, There are a lot of TV commercials at either the table in the living room or the dining room. The table represents relationships. Relationships are everything, and the church is supposed to be in the relationship business. So God takes bad, and out of it comes some good things. He uses it for good. All things work together. Letter C, because God is in control, my prayers have an impact. Does Satan ever talk to you? Well, some people would say all the time, and other people would say, I don't, I don't have a clue. I don't think so. You know, sometimes I think we, we believe that our thoughts and our temptations just come from in here, and sometimes they do. But Satan whispers all the time. You go to pray, and he says, prayer doesn't work. You're like thinking, ah, am I going to pray? Last time I prayed, I did, nothing happened. Or he says, uh, God's real busy. <laughs> And what you have to say isn't important or just a waste of time or, or you know, sometimes you've just been too bad. God's not, God's not interested in talking to you. But prayer has impact. And when we pray, God overrules things. I- impossibilities become possible and darkness becomes light and sorrow becomes rejoicing. In 1 John 5, 14, it says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything, According to his will, he hears us. Now, it goes on beyond that, but that's, I wanted you to get that part. He hears us. What would you ask for today? It's your choice. That's one of the things that God does not control. Your choice. What would you ask for? I already told you, but one of the safest and the most dangerous requests, I know that's a paradox or an oxymoron or something, one of the safest and most dangerous requests you'll ever put before God is, What now, Lord? Come on, Lord, tell me. Are you sure you want to know? What now, Lord? So acknowledge his control, enjoy his presence, his love, his blessing, with the understanding that nothing can permanently devastate me. I put the word permanently there. Things do devastate us, but nothing permanently permanently can devastate me because he is Lord. Let me close with these words from St. Paul. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory. I want to to pray. We haven't done this in a while, but I want us to pray a a sinner's prayer. And I just pray the prayer, and if if it's something you need to pray for your life, your heart, uh, make it your prayer. And if not, just say, for whoever, for whoever this is for, Lord, make it a blessing. Okay? You know, when I confess my sins, the question is, what happens to my sins? Well, they're gone. As far as the east is from the west into the sea of God's forgetfulness. That's what he says. He chooses to forget. We don't, we're not able to do that, but and never to be remembered against me again. So, as most of you know, I put together a little prayer a long time ago, and if it needs to be, if it's your prayer, reach out and grab it, okay? Let's, let's pray together. Oh, God, be merciful to me. Forgive me for living selfishly and for shutting you out of my life. It's true, I have not acknowledged you as my Lord, and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I open the, heart, the door of my heart right now and just invite you to come in. By faith, I'll receive you as my Lord. Live in me and sit on the throne of my life. I've been sitting on that throne my whole life. Come, I just take myself off the throne. You come and sit on the throne and you reign and rule. Thank you for hearing and answering my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Let's stand together. May the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will 
And may he work in you what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Just before dawn, I dreamed I talked with mom and dad. Their smiles aglow, so clearly show their total bliss. But let me add that their return stem from concern. God's plan 